watches the intellectual watchmen? When it comes to historians, especially those purporting to tell the truth about the founding of America, the Nobel Prize winner James Buchanan, and the godfather of Austrian economics Ludwig von Mises, it's Phil Magnus of the American Institute for Economic Research. Magnus has a PhD from George Mason University School of Public Policy, and he's written or co-written books on what he calls the moral mess of higher education, on Abraham Lincoln's plan for black resettlement after emancipation, and on the six 1919 project. He's emerged as that project's most dogged critic, finding that the Pulitzer Prize winning series developed by MacArthur Genius Grant winner Nicole Hannah-Jones was quietly revised at the New York Times website after several prominent historians pointed out major errors in its analysis. She goes on CNN and someone asked her a question about this line and she says, I never said that. I never made that claim. But of course we know that 1776 was the founding of this country. The project does not argue that 1776 was not the founding of the country. I started thinking, I've seen her make that claim 20 or 30 times, and I think it was in the original text. And I go back to the website, and it's no longer there. Magnus has also been a leading critic of Duke historian Nancy McLean, whose National Book Award winning Democracy in Chains attempted to brand the school choice movement as motivated by racism. That this whole uh, set of ideas um, has been twined really since the beginning of our country, these notions of extreme economic liberty with racial subjugation. She said, I'm not going to even bother consulting anyone that works in the public choice, right. Buchanan tradition. And her, her excuse, she said this in an interview, says, I don't want to tip them off that I've discovered their, their dirty laundry or something. And he's a critic of Hans Hermann Hoppe, a professor emeritus at UNLV and a distinguished senior fellow at the Mises Institute, who is increasingly influential within the Libertarian Party. And Hoppe has tried to invent this kind of carved out counter narrative while still claiming to be a representative of Mises that says we can use this propertarian concept of the nation state to exclude undesired groups, exclude immigrants from crossing the borders. And it's, it's a in, complete inversion of Mises' thought, and yet he's doing it under the mantle of saying, well, I'm the heir of Rothbard, who's the heir of Mises. Magnus also wrote an article for Reason that's inspired an ongoing plagiarism investigation at Princeton University of Kevin Cruz, a high profile, very online professor of history. This is a guy that would tweet one or 200 times a day as a live stream of American politics. And then as soon as the, uh, the word got out about plagiarism, he's dropped off the face of the earth. Reason caught up with Magnus at Freedom Fest, the annual gathering in Las Vegas, to talk about intellectual accountability in academia, journalism, and the libertarian movement. Phil Magnus, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having me. Um, you recently wrote a piece for Reason uh, where you documented that Kevin Cruz, a, a presidential historian who's at Princeton University, you know, seems to be guilty of plagiarism. Uh, you know, part of that, it's a gotcha just because plagiarism is a bad thing, but because Cruz himself had called out various people for right. exactly the same thing. Can you recap the argument against Kevin Cruz for us? Yeah, so uh, this actually started uh, almost two years ago. I was asked to review uh, his book, One Nation Under God, which came out uh, in the late 2010s. And it's a, a purported history of religiosity in 20th century America. And he has this thesis that says that basically it's New Deal opponents connected to libertarians mm -hmm. in the mid 20th century unite with the business audiences to force Christianity upon right. the public and the religious right. And this is right. like when, uh, you know, in God We Trust exactly. started showing up and, you know, certain additions to the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah, whatnot, so right? it's basically, uh, he makes argument, Leonard Reed ends up at Jerry Falwell, is basically right. his, his thesis. Okay. And I'm reading this book, and in addition to critiquing the academic side of it, I start noticing some of the passages, uh, and one stood out in particular was this obscure quote by Abraham Lincoln. And I was like, I, I had seen that before because I've done a lot of work on Lincoln's presidency. And it just kind of nagged on my mind. And I started digging into some of his sources. And then I found he had taken it from a partially cited article in the New York Times 
but there were uh, real strong textual similarities, like uh, almost identical sentences and maybe mm -hmm. one or two words changed. I thought, wait a minute, this looks a little, uh, it, it's lazy to say the, yeah. the worst, but it's, um, it's plagiarism probably. Yeah. Uh, so that made me very suspicious of his other works. And then he pops up again, Cruz is an author for the 1619 Project, and I had been working on uh, uh, some of the response to that. And I was uh, several months after I had made the discovery mm -hmm. on, uh, on the Lincoln quote, I, uh, I searched his source, which comes from another book he wrote, uh, White Flight, in 2005, which was based on his doctoral dissertation. So I, I'm checking the footnotes, uh, seeing where this comes from, and I pulled the dissertation to compare it to uh, something that looks suspicious in the book. And right there on like page 10 of the dissertation is uh, basically an entire paragraph that was lifted from another work without any attribution. Mm -hmm. Uh, did the same thing where he moved a few quotes around, mm -hmm. and that really set off the red flag. Yeah. So that was the discovery. So, and what uh, you know, what was his response? Well, I contacted him uh, when I was getting ready to run the piece, and asked. I said, "Do you have any comment on this?" And I think his quote was, "He inartfully paraphrased." Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was kind of a dodgy language, yeah. uh, trying to minimize it. Uh, but then after that, uh, he went completely radio silent. This is a guy that would tweet one or 200 times a day mm -hmm. as a live stream of American politics. Right. And then as soon as the, uh, the word got out about plagiarism, he's dropped off the face of the earth. What has happened? Uh, do you know, is there, you know, has, uh, you know, his faculty colleagues at Princeton or like how... How do plagiarism cases typically get adjudicated within yeah. the academy? Well, every university has a standard, and mm -hmm. it's mostly to deal with uh, students that plagiarize right. in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And Princeton has a very strict one at that. It, uh, it, they say at some points even uh, quoting or borrowing phrases as short as three or four words without quotation mm -hmm. marks are inappropriate, and, uh, and he did much more than that. Uh, the problem is when you're dealing with a kind of a celebrity faculty, an A-lister that's a regular on MSNBC, mm -hmm. 1619 Project author, uh, there's some political cachet there. So getting their attention on it uh, proved mm -hmm. very difficult. So I first alerted the university after the earliest discoveries, I think that was December 2021, and heard nothing for mm -hmm. six months. And it really actually took the story breaking until mm -hmm. other people started calling Princeton and saying, mm -hmm. uh, hey, do you have a comment on this? And then they finally dig into their email and found that I had contacted them months ago, yeah. reach out. And ever since then, I've been cooperating with them and trying to, to give mm -hmm. them all the documentation that I found. Yeah. Uh, so there's a uh, some sort of a proceeding that's uh, uh, going on right now. Why does plagiarism matter? You know, I think it's uh, one of the areas, well, there's two reasons. First, it is intellectual theft. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's borrowing someone else's work without properly crediting it. Uh, so there, that cuts to the core of academic research. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you cite your sources and you also properly credit people for the work that mm -hmm. they've performed. Uh, but it's also, I think, one of the like, quote unquote crimes in academia mm -hmm. that is still taken seriously, still given a very uh, rigorous penalty, uh, irrespective of the politics. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's something that I think all sides agree on is, uh, is right. proper to, to police for. And again, this is credibility before your students in the classroom. If you want to tell your students not to cheat, you also have to make sure right. your own work doesn't do that. And of course, I mean, this, it broadly, I mean, this is a very kind of abstract and high-minded thing. It's part of the Enlightenment project, right? Absolutely. That we all, we all share our sources, our kind of our data set, whether it's quotes yeah. or actual data, because... It, it's not only for personal aggrandizement, but it's also that way people can check to make sure the Absolutely. math is correct, right? Yes. That you're Replicate making your sense, et cetera. Yes. Yeah. Um, you have made, uh, among you know the many things that you do, you have a kind of sub-career in calling people out for either plagiarism or analytical mistakes. Right. Um, you know, a couple of years ago when Nancy McLean wrote a book uh, accusing James Buchanan in particular, the Nobel Prize winning economist right. of, you know, essentially being a handmade or a hand master to white supremacy, you called her out on a bunch of analytical and fundamental errors. Right. Um, now that's a, it's a little bit different than plagiarism, right? Because there you're not saying she took other people's work and tried to pass it off on her own, but she fundamentally misunderstood Absolutely. what she was talking about. Yeah, and misrepresenting sources. And I think yeah. some of that has come out to be pretty willful. It's mm -hmm. uh, you compare the original letters versus what she says in the book. And uh, she's giving a very heavy spin mm -hmm. that omits certain words, cuts quotes in half, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. 
Uh, so I think it affirmed a political story she wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. And then it also turns out it's layered over with just basic unfamiliarity with the subject matter. So right. she commits error after error after error and they compound. Because even though she's a, a very highly regarded historian, very you know award winning, all of that right. kind of stuff, this was new material and she just wasn't that facile with it. That's exactly it. And yeah. She went even further. She said, I'm not going to even bother consulting anyone that works in the public choice right. Buchanan tradition. And her, her excuse, she said this in an interview, she says, I don't want to tip them off that I've discovered their their dirty laundry or something. Yeah. And this, you know, it reminded me when that came out, it was the way Michelle Malkin, uh, you know, who's right. not an intellectual, but wrote a book defending the internment of the Japan, of Japanese Americans during World War II. And in her prologue or forward, she said, like, I'm not burdened with like, you know, having uh, been taught this in academia. So yeah. like I have an advantage over people who actually know the subject because right. I haven't been indoctrinated. This is kind of like the inverse of that. Well, yeah, it's a, a hubris that comes at it. Yeah. Uh, she purports to understand externally because she has mm -hmm. uh, certain political priors and political training. Right. And that's been the, the full extent of her response to me, uh, other than to accuse me of being some part of this vast conspiracy yeah. against her. So yes. to talk about accountability there, and I guess yeah. also it's, you know, uh, I think Hayek in um, 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 The Counter-Revolution of Science talks about scientism as a mechanical application of a system of belief on a subject matter without any interest in the particulars of it. And I mean, it seems like McLean is being very scientific, just... Like she doesn't need to good. know the details. She doesn't need to know context because she knows what she knows. Yeah. Um, but um, what has been, have there been any ramifications for Nancy McLean in, you know, and I, I think your your case, you know, people like Michael Munger, her colleague at Duke, mm -hmm. um, you know, have raised serious questions, um, you know, and engaged in argument. And one of the, you know, one thinks the goal of the academy is to ha stage exactly these kinds of debates because like people are going to come up with new theories, new understandings, new analysis, which really upsets the apple cart. Right. And it's fierce. But like, um, has that been happening with Nancy McLean? It's quite the contrary. She has gotten top book awards and she was a finalist for the National Book Prize. Mm -hmm. This comes out after the controversy is, yep. is revealed. Uh, she is a keynote plenary speaker at the uh, Organization of American Historians mm -hmm. and all the major conferences uh, is very much celebrated on the on the speaking mm -hmm. circuit for the supposed discovery she made in her book. And the early reviews that came out of the media, and these are uh, uh, generally left of center, they were mm -hmm. uh, favorable to her. So one of the arguments I've pointed out, uh, I think she's tapped into, if you remember the old Stephen Colbert concept of truthiness? Yes. Uh, that's very much what's at play in the Academy right, right now. So it's like even if she's not actually accurate Broadly speaking, she is right. Yes, she's yeah. tapped into what the they facts. want to be right, independent of the facts. So another person who you have uh, spent a lot of time over the past few years sparring with is Nicole Hannah-Jones in the 1619 Project. You put together a book-length response to that. Uh, you continue to chart, um, you know, fascinatingly, not just, again, like large, um, you know, analytic errors or historical errors and things like that, but the way that the New York Times is stealth editing Absolutely. the 1619 Project. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to understand that they were doing that? Yeah, yeah. So when I first read the 1619 Project, I was actually excited because they were working in a subject area that I know well. Mm -hmm. uh, the history of slavery is a very deep and nuanced a yeah. topic that needs to be investigated. Right. But then I see the political bias coming in. But I, I started out as a partial critic of it. Mm -hmm. uh, critiqued its economics, which were bad, uh, but also gave it some credit and even sure. defended it on a few points. Yeah. But what, uh, what started to emerge is as Nicole Hannah-Jones responded to some of the measured, level-headed criticisms mm -hmm. Uh, she was just being dismissive of them entirely. Right. And, and we're here we're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, incredibly as establishment historians in right. the, you know, in the left liberal center of academia, yes. people like Gordon Wood. Gordon Wood, exactly. Yeah. And James McPherson. These yeah. are people that uh, Sean Malintz, who mm -hmm. is famously a well-established Princeton center-left historian. Right, yeah. And they came out with very measured criticisms mm -hmm. and said, hey, you need to, to, to fix some of these factual errors. Right. And she responds, basically, oh, they're, they're a bunch of white historians and I don't consider them preeminent. I don't right. consider them important. Yeah. And that's when you start seeing a, a kind of the, uh, the, 
the discussion around the 1619 Project turns is really in those first few months after it's published. Mm -hmm. So the next thing is uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones is nominated by the New York Times for a Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. uh, this was their preeminent uh, offering in 2019 and they were uh, definitely promoting her essay. Mm -hmm. uh, so right around the time that the Pulitzer Committee is evaluating and, and, and making these judgments, what I come to discover after the fact, and I, I think it was the first person that really broke this out into the open, is that the newspaper itself had stealth edited this line that appeared on its website mm -hmm. about uh, 1619 being the true founding as opposed to 1776. Mm -hmm. And it had been very controversial from the moment the project launch. Uh, and I mean, it was part of the selling point, exactly. right? Because it is, it, it's kind of a breathtaking and interesting reframing of American history. It I mean, it, it has to be, you know, really kind of controversial in Especially, order to be yeah. worth It's provocative. Talking. Yeah. And there could be a provocative case being yeah. made for this. Sure. But she came under fire for it. And right in the middle of Pulitzer season, this line suddenly disappears off of the New York mm -hmm. Times' website. Six months later, the Trump administration is going after the 1619 Project mm -hmm. with its competitor, 1776 Project. Right. And uh, she goes on CNN, and someone asked her a question about this line, and she says, I never said that. Mm -hmm. I never made that claim. And I start thinking, well, I, I've seen her make that claim mm -hmm. 20 or 30 times, and I think it was in the original text. And I go back to the website, and it's no longer there. Mm -hmm. So it was a journalistic misconduct case, right. I think. Uh, and now that's, it's a little bit different because it's journalism versus right. academia, right? right? So it's it's not that, you know, journalism is less serious, but it kind of plays by different roles. And part of her response was, it seemed when she was being attacked by historians for being inaccurate, part of her response seemed to be like, well, you know, I'm a journalist. Don't right. hold me by those standards. But of course, now she is an academic. Right. Um, and I guess a larger question then, and certainly she is, she fills the role of a public intellectual, yeah. as do you. You know, I, I like to think that I do. I mean, so it's where you may not be following, you know, academic, uh, you know, the, the rules of academic disciplines and sub subcategories all the time, but you're expected to be arguing in good faith and yeah. respond to serious criticism and yeah. things like that. Um, do you think Nicole Hannah-Jones, like Nancy McLean, like Kevin Cruz, although uh, the jury's kind of out on him, is, you know, her unwillingness to really engage her critics, is that symptomatic of a larger breakdown in public intellectual life in America? And very much so. And there's a common thread among all three of these figures, mm -hmm. Cruz, McLean, and Nicole Hannah-Jones. Uh, they like to attack critics that are of the Newt Gingrich stripe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they like to attack the Trump administration. Right. Uh, Cruz is, was infamous for picking Twitter fights with like right-leaning soccer no, moms. And, and, and also in like Dinesh D'Souza, who yeah, yeah. may have at some point been a public intellectual, but has, you know, shut right. the bed it's, on that. He's, he's like mentally ill or, <laughs> or, or intellectually unserious. Right, right. But yeah, Cruz would like, he spent a lot of time engaging and pointing out how bad Dinesh D'Souza's history was. Yeah. But, but they, they don't want to engage the serious academic mm -hmm. critics. And this is a real shortcoming that comes in Nicole Hannah-Jones' book version. Mm -hmm. She says, well, I'm responding to my critics, and the critics she goes after are the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, let's go uh, respond to the, the serious historians that right. have actually done work on this subject. Yeah. Um, so do you think that's new, and is it growing, or is that actually just the way that uh, you know, kind of intellectual life ever was. I'm thinking of uh, Richard Hofstadter exactly. in a book about anti-intellectualism in American life. Like he opens, you know, which I, can't, I guess came out in the late 50s or early 60s, but he came out, you know, he opens with a whole thing about how he's not going to actually engage Bill Buckley in the National right. Review because this is a book about intellectuals and anti-intellectualism and like they're not worth right. engaging Partly because they refute his thesis, it seems. What's well, the luxury of picking your critics? Yeah. So, I mean, is this new or is this just really the way things always work? That people kind of get a free ride depending on who they are and what they're saying and where they're saying it. And then it's up to people like you to, yeah. you know, kind of pick at them until they either engage you or 
people get tired with their arguments and say, oh, you know, here's an alternative reading that I find more persuasive. Right, right. So I think that that, that current has always been there. Um, you know, it's, it's very convenient to be able to attack a straw man on the other side. Yeah. And if you have a caricature that's making that straw man for you, you can ignore the serious substantive right. versions. I think it's intensified uh, pretty dramatically in the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And this has been, you know, it's an empirical fact. The Academy has moved to the political far left pretty aggressively. Mm -hmm. And you see this in faculty surveys. It used to be kind of a, a plurality on the center left. 45% of faculty lean that way. And then you had smaller sections across yeah. the spectrum. Now we're in the 60 to 65% range. And then in disciplines. How do, you, how do you define being on the far left? Or? Yeah, so they, uh, using survey data here, yeah. and this goes back to the Carnegie Commission in the early 60s, they poll faculty every couple of years and say, where do you fall on the, on the simple left, right? I think it's a five point spectrum. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see very clear, dramatic growth on the left. And the interesting thing is it has not matched the general population. You know, mm -hmm. they ask the same survey Gallup does of, uh, of general American voters. Right. And they're pretty stable over time. Right, but the right. faculty has gotten out of line with that. And in, in many profound ways, I mean, maybe the last few years, not quite uh, in this, but I mean, the country kind of moved right, actually, yep. over the same time that the faculty moved yeah. yeah. What What do you think explains that kind of... Um, uh, Hegira to uh, you know uh, or you know flight on the academic uh, you know in academia towards a further left wing yeah. perspective. Well, most recently it's Trumpism, and, uh, and there are yeah. understandable criticisms to have a yeah, Trump. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I think it's a deeper phenomenon that comes to the job crunch in academia, mm -hmm. and what it's become is political ideology is now a rationing mechanism for a very, very scarce number of jobs mm -hmm. in the humanities in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, we had overproduction of PhDs going back for decades, mm -hmm. competing for a tiny number of jobs to, to mm -hmm. just refill on the tenure cycle. And uh, you need a sorting mechanism <clears throat> when you're having 200, 300 people applying for the same right. position. And if you have a faculty that already leans one way, they're going to choose people who look and think and act the same way that right. they do. I have to say, you know, I hadn't thought about this in a while, but I, I was in grad school uh, from 88 to 93 taking yeah. classes. And I remember the election of George H.W. Bush, and, you know, and it might be just because I was there, but that was a flashpoint. Nobody, uh, you know, and I was doing literature uh, and cultural studies, but nobody believe that George H.W. Bush would win because right. he was so obviously a puppet and not serious and not popular. And Reaganism was this kind of weird phenomenon that, you know, that was a bubble that had popped. And when Dukakis lost and lost resoundingly, actually, to, yeah. to H.W., that was a moment where people kind of lost their shit. And they were, uh, you know, remember, People saying like I don't I don't feel comfortable in my own country. A lot of the arguments now that left wing academics talk about, um, you know, right wing uh, kind of yokels that yeah. you know a white poor white Christian types are always talking about being a stranger in their own country. Academics were talking about that in the late eighties, and I, I suspect that that might have politicized people deeply. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's the echo chamber, and what it testifies to is the problem that emerges when you have a faculty that all swings one way. Because mm -hmm. there's no one internally on the faculty to challenge them anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, say, conservative, libertarian, other types, even moderates yeah. were a minority of the professoriate, uh, they were at least there to say, uh, wait a minute, this book is going off the rails and some of its political arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, let's counterweight it in peer review. Do you give any stock to the argument, which uh, one hears from time to time, that it's also that conservatives in particular, you know, are not particularly interested in intellectual endeavors, that they hate the academy. And actually, we see this certainly since Trump. Yeah. But it goes back deeper where people on the right have, you know, absolute, you know, hostility to higher education. And yeah. they yeah. dismiss anything in the humanities, philosophy, literature, history, you know, as, as a waste, like the only thing that should be taught in, you know, higher ed is engineering or like high end versions of technical fields. Um, do you think that's a contributing factor? Well, I think it's a chicken and the egg situation mm -hmm. because, yes, on the one hand, conservatives yeah. are not going into uh, some of these academic mm -hmm. fields. Uh, but the, the flip side of it is uh, where is there a doctoral program 
that is conducive to non-left-leaning thought right. uh, in the history profession, in the philosophy profession, mm -hmm. in English. Uh, they're basically non-existent. You have a mm -hmm. few peripheral things like Hillsdale College, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's basically it. What they've created is a very unwelcome environment mm -hmm. in majoring in history for anyone that thinks outside of a very narrow mm -hmm. slice of the political spectrum. Yeah. And you see this in undergrad majors are, are abandoning it. Mm -hmm. uh, history is perennially a, a popular topic in the general mm -hmm. public. Uh, you look at the New York Times bestseller list, at any given moment, there's right. something about American history. The history is like the, the best-selling genre for... Exactly. Yeah, forever. Exactly. But but they're not academic history texts. Uh, some mm -hmm. of them are pop history, yeah. some of them are patriotic history, and those all have their problems. Yeah, yeah. But the interest in the subject matter is right. there. Why is that not translating into mm -hmm. students majoring in these yeah. subjects? And I think a, a big part of it is they're being scared away sure. by uh, kind of the groupthink, the echo chamber that exists right. in these disciplines. Um, talk a bit about your intellectual and academic pedigree. Yeah. Where did you go to undergrad and grad school? What did you study? And you know how you seem to be very atypical, not only in, about what you write, but now, and I want to talk about this, you, you don't work within the academy. Right. You work at AIER, the American Institute of economic, for, economic, for research. economic research, excuse me, and um, you know, and that's an interesting perch. But like, you know, yeah. what what's your intellectual story? Yeah, so I uh, I started as an undergrad, uh, interested in political science and economics, mm -hmm. uh, also a historical angle. Yeah. Where did you go to uh, University of St. Thomas in Houston? A small okay. liberal arts tradition, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I wrote a. Uh, uh, a senior thesis on the economics of slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was interested in political history. Mm -hmm. uh, thought I was going to dabble in grad school, so I went. Uh, I moved to uh, the Washington D.C. area uh, to do a master's degree in public policy at George Mason. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought I was going to work in the policy sphere on free trade. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did a, a brief stand on Capitol Hill, found that it was dominated by lawyers rather than economists. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of off-putting. But at the same time, I found graduate school allowed me to do mm -hmm. interesting research on things that I cared about that were a bit removed from the political puzzle. Right. So uh, I continued at George Mason. Uh, I got a doctorate there in public policy with an mm -hmm. economic history focus, mm -hmm. uh, writing on 19th century tax policy. It sounds mm -hmm. like a snooze, but it uh, I really I laughed out me. there for a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I'm sure it's fascinating, actually. Yeah. It's right? uh, other than slavery, it's the biggest debate of the mm -hmm. entire 19th century, and it intersects with slavery well, in very profound yeah. ways. So uh, George Mason is one of those schools where, you know, certainly the economics department right. and, the, and the law school um, lean libertarian, really. Yep. I mean, they're not conservative by any stretch. Um, was the public policy school like that as well? Yes, there was a, um, um, at least when I, I was there, uh, we when had- When did you graduate? Uh, when? This was 2010 okay. is when I, I finished. So I was there for uh, most mm -hmm. of the 2000s. And uh, so my chair was a, uh, he's a, um, he's retired now, but he's an Austrian economist, economic historian. Who is that? Uh, Jack High. Okay. So, and he, uh, he kind of came up with that same generation that out of the 1970s that mm -hmm. uh, picked up the mantle from Hayek and mm -hmm. Mises uh, to continue work in Austrian yeah. economics. Uh, but I had a very mixed committee that included people on both the, the right and the left yeah. and everywhere in between. Um, worked with some Austrian economists, some real mm -hmm. traditional trade economists, traditional mm -hmm. political scientists, yeah. traditional historians. What what happened at George Mason? I mean, it's a, it's an interesting uh, school because it, you know it's it's a state supported university. Yeah. It was kind of a commuter school through the seventies and eighties. They had a president who was kind of an empire builder exactly. and really jacked up the academic. Uh, standing of the school, partly by realizing, and you know, places like NYU uh, and uh, you know uh, Chapman University, where they these are schools that were not particularly academically forward, and then somebody realized we're in a great location, we can basically hire anybody we want, we can get the best faculty in the world, and they do it. But what were the conditions that led George Mason to becoming? more interested in kind of heterodox thinking and, you know, particularly in the law school and the economics department and public policy, things like Austrian economics and, you know, libertarian thinking. Yeah, it's entrepreneurship. And they, mm -hmm. they basically did an academic version of the money ball strategy. Mm -hmm. They looked around and saw people that were undervalued at mm -hmm. their other institutions because maybe they were the wrong political stripe mm -hmm. or uh, the wrong methodological yeah. approach. Uh, and they, they started recruiting. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so Karen Vaughn and Henry Manny are the two right. major figures that uh, really, uh, and their department chairs are in uh, Manny's right. case, head of the law school. Right. And they look around and say, okay, well, who are these faculty that are heavy hitters in their intellectual mm -hmm. output? but they're kind of at backwaters or mm -hmm. uh, they're at a teaching institution mm -hmm. and we can pull them in here and you know, we're up and coming. We're not uh, tier one uh, R1 research right. university yet, but we bring them in and we're going to start being heavy yeah. hitters. And that's where they found James Buchanan and Gordon Tulloch. They yeah. were kind of disgruntled faculty that had been through university of Virginia and then Virginia right. tech and never really uh, uh, were able yeah. to, to set up a home. Uh, or they were chased off by what, hostile administrators. What is the, you know, what's the role also of outside money? Because, you know, the uh, Charles Koch right. was a major benefactor of George Mason. Uh, you know, our various sub, subgroups there. Um, how did that play in? And do, does that, you know, this is one of the critiques yeah. that gets leveled at places like George Mason. Well, you know what, the, the faculty is bought and paid for and they're ideologues that get imported in, you know, and it becomes right. kind of, you know, it's, it's a laughable argument <clears throat> when you talk about somebody like a James Buchanan or Gordon Tulloch or Vernon Smith, who was, you know, at University of Arizona, then George Mason, and it's now at Chapman. But, you know, it dogs even Nobel Absolutely. Prize winning Absolutely economists. Yeah. Um, but, you know, is, is there a concern with that or how do you safeguard um, universities, you know, getting money from people who have an ideology and an agenda without compromising intellectual integrity. Absolutely. Well, I think there's a an asymmetry of complaints that occur in this department. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, money coming from causes that are more politically aligned with the academy is everywhere. Right. Uh, I, mean, I know it's a trope to say Soros money yeah. or uh, Tom or Steyer money. Or the Ford Foundation yeah, or something Ford, yeah. like that, right? And there, there are, I mean, for every one Koch Foundation, there are a dozen foundations mm -hmm. that are over, overtly progressive yeah. and are putting money into overtly progressive political programs. Mm -hmm. uh, so the counterweights here, I mean, the, the, there's no comparison even that they're on the same level. Uh, yeah, uh, just in the amount of funding and the or pure influence. Amount. Yeah. And the people that object to Coke funding at George Mason, you, you know, you look at their own departments and you find that they took uh, tens of millions of dollars from one of these other foundations. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the progressive side, and yeah. they had no concern whatsoever about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so if they applied their own rules to themselves, they would be excluded from uh, public intellectual life right. uh, because they have discredited themselves with left-wing dark money. Yeah. Uh, the other thing to consider here, look at the academic output. Look at the citations in the top mm -hmm. journals that some of these scholars are hitting. Yeah. And people like James Buchanan, here's a guy that published on a regular basis in the American Economic Review, right. uh, major groundbreaking articles that get five or 10,000 citations that mm -hmm. change the direction of the field. You can't tell me that that person is not doing it on their own merit. Right. Um, you, um, why didn't you go into a, a traditional or conventional academic yeah. um, so, you know, I, I taught in higher ed for about a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went through mostly teaching institutions. Mm -hmm. Where did uh, you teach? So I taught at American University in mm -hmm. D.C., George Mason, uh, and then Berry College in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I had a great time at all three, mm -hmm. although um, I, I always found that uh, the teaching emphasis was about the only route that I could go to get a job right. by having the ideas that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it didn't matter about the scholarly output. I mean, I'm, I'm someone that uh, I, I don't want to toot my own horn yeah, in yeah. a sense, but you're yeah, prolific. Yeah, prolific. Uh, hit decent journals mm -hmm. of Oxford University Press, mm -hmm. uh, doing work that gets noticed and cited, but it's often from a perspective that's not as valued in the academy. Right. And what that means, and I think this is true of anyone that falls outside of kind of a very narrow progressive echo chamber. Uh, you have to hit far above your weight to even get a teaching position, whereas someone with fewer publications, mm -hmm. less of a scholarly impact than yourself, gets an easy job at Princeton yeah. uh, with full research support, uh, with uh, access to tons of money. Yeah. Uh, you know, this was the thing with the, uh, when the McLean controversy was going on. She's claiming there's this massive conspiracy against her. She's a tenured prof at Duke University. Mm -hmm making easily high six-figure salaries. Mm -hmm. And she's claiming that I was this person that was the hired gun to take down her book. Mm -hmm. I was making maybe, what, 70K 
on a three, four teaching load mm -hmm. at a small liberal arts college right. and funding my research out of pocket. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I had uh, a weekend off. Mm -hmm. I drove over to Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, paid my own gasoline, paid the mm -hmm. hotel out of pocket uh, just to check the sources and do uh, the archival work. Mm -hmm. Whereas she is uh, operating on these massive grants that are coming through her university. Uh, so there's, there's a real asymmetry there. Is there something odd about um, you know, libertarians or outliers? You know, they're they're you know they're kind, on some level and not completely, um, but you know, oftentimes they're kept out of elite institutions. Yeah. But then they also seem to, you know, desperately want to join a club. I mean, it's kind of like a Groucho Marx line. Where they definitely, you know, they want you know. They spend all of their time railing against Harvard and Yale and Princeton, but they desperately want to be validated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is that is, is I, just a performative contradiction? I, I, I think that's a, just a, a, the nature of academics is yeah. they shoot for the prestige journals, they shoot mm -hmm. for the prestige departments. And you know, at the end of the day, if you are a uh, professor in the Harvard poli-sci department mm -hmm. or economics department, you have the best grad students, mm -hmm. you have TAs for every single class, you have tens of thousands of dollars in research money that's mm -hmm. available to you, things that uh, someone teaching at a small institution simply does not right. have. Yeah. So it, it is, a, it's materially, it's a better place oh, absolutely. to be. Absolutely. It's, sure. it's, a, it's a more comfortable life. Um, and yet these are, I, I guess, you know, these are particularly not, not somebody like Milton Friedman. He's yeah. one of the great examples or, or exceptions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then, you know, people like Hayek and Mises clearly mm -hmm. were, you know, didn't get the university positions that they right. might have deserved at a certain point. Right. Maybe, maybe Hayek later in his life. Um, but um, when you joined AIER, mm -hmm. then, you know, how, I guess, what's the difference between doing the work that you do at a think tank, which has an ideology yeah. and is not, you know, it's not an academic institution. Yeah. Um, what's the difference between working in a place like that and in academia? Well, I think that probably the biggest thing, other than the, the lack of the teaching obligation, because that yeah. is a, a draw on your time, right. uh, is the intellectual freedom mm -hmm. to uh, pursue research in areas that uh, you know, would have been fun or intellectually enticing or even valuable for me in the academy, but they simply would not uh, get me into certain journals. Right. They would not be rewarded. Yep. Or even if I, if I do hit a top journal, and I did on several pieces that yep. I wrote, uh, it's not seen as the same as uh, someone who hits the same journal uh, telling a different political story. Right. So, I mean, how do you, I, and I guess, uh, you know, how do, how do you make sure, though, that, you know, you don't drift off into a, a, a libertarian echo chamber, Absolutely. a right-wing yeah. echo chamber, because part of the ideal version of academia is that people belong to discourse communities and within you know any particular field, economics, history, literature, there are expert, sub-experts in your field who really you're engaging and are keeping you honest. Um, you know, and obviously we started this conversation by talking about places where people are not being exactly. kept honest, but how do you make sure that you don't just kind of, you know, go off a cliff into your own personal obsessions where you can avoid your critics yeah. or you can avoid people who have serious reservations about your project? Well, part of it's uh, holding my own work to account. Uh, I mean, the, the easy route would be I could churn out hundreds of pages and send them to the insane old journal of right. libertarian yeah. activism. I think I'm uh, on their editorial <laughs> advisory. <laughs> they they, they may yeah. have me as well yeah. doing their book yeah. reviews or something. Yeah. But um, part of holding myself to account, I asked mm -hmm. the question, I've got a piece that I think is good. Can I hit this in a mainstream journal? Mm -hmm. uh, can I get this on a mainstream press? Or send it mm -hmm. to uh, Newsweek or the Wall Street Journal as opposed to uh, National Review? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's value in both of these right. types of, uh, of publications. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I try to ensure that at least some subset of my work is going before mainstream scholarly publications mm -hmm. that directly engage it. Yeah. Now, uh, kind of the double-edged sword here is I often engage some of the, uh, the that literature as a critic. Right. And there's room for that still in the journals, but it doesn't make you popular. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure Nancy McLean and Kevin Cruz yeah. and all these guys, uh, they probably have a, a voodoo doll where they stick pins in yeah. me every night. But <laughs> When you, uh, you know, in, in journalism or in media more broadly, I think most people are, are certainly on the, you know, on the libertarian end of things. 
really celebrate the decline of barriers to entry. You know, yeah. everybody can be a journalist now. And, you know, that means the volume vastly increases, um, you know, and the garbage does. That absolutely does. But <laughs> it also, you know, you're, you, you know, you're not judging a field by the amount of garbage. It's the, you know, the gems that you find exactly. inside that. And do you think in intellectual life, in public into, intellectual life, are we in a better place now than, say, 20 or 30 years ago because of the proliferation of groups? AIER goes, AIER goes back to what, like the 1930s? 1933. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, it's one of the very oldest kind of think tanks uh, or, you know, simulations in, in American history. Um, but, you know, there's a proliferation of these types yeah. of groups. Are we better off for that, or does that just you know, mostly increase noise rather than signal. Yeah. Again, it's a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that there are more outlets means that you can get uh, arguments to the forefront of the discussion yeah. that otherwise would have been gatekept, held mm -hmm. out. Uh, but I, I always go back to, there was an interview Milton Friedman did about 1995 in Reason Magazine. Mm -hmm. And the interviewer asked him, he said, well, don't you think it's great? We have all these institutions. They're proliferating. Right. And he says, well... Suppose that could be a good thing, and I'm paraphrasing him here, yeah. but I don't think we have the talent to fill them all. Right. And I think we still have that issue. There are a lot mm -hmm. more libertarians uh, than there are libertarians uh, working at uh, the level of rigor that's necessary mm -hmm. to bring that work into the public debate. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about when accountability works, and then yeah. I want to ask you about accountability on the, the libertarian end of things, Absolutely. or conservative. Um, uh, you know, going back some years, Michael Belial was exactly. a, a historian at Emory. He was, and he published a book that talked about how the idea that in colonial America and, and the early Republic, gun ownership was widespread. And he, you know, he seemed to have an airtight case. People like Edmund Morgan, you know, the mm -hmm. dean of colonial American history, was like, "Wow, this guy has revolutionized the field, et cetera." It turned out that he was a fraud. Like he mm -hmm. made up his sources and then compounded it by every time people were like, well, let's see your data. And it was like, oh, you know, there's a water line broke or my, you know, there's my computer. My so yeah, I mean, yeah. it was like unbelievable, but he effectively got flushed out of the system. He did. Yeah. So, you know, accountability is still possible. Yeah. Right. Um, who are the people broadly, I guess, on the right or who tend to agree with you, with your critique of kind of left of center, you know, academia or intellectual work? Who are the people that need to get flushed out of the system <laughs> that you think are doing bad work? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I do worry about, well, I guess there's two things here. Yeah. Very few of them are in the academy anymore because right. uh, the number of people on the right that hold professorships, I think it's like 10 to 12% of the academy mm -hmm. now. And that's down from like 30% in 1980. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's very few that are working in there. But you do have, uh, you know, instances... Uh, of people that venture far afield of their lanes. Mm -hmm. uh, so one, just I'm just naming because I heard him on the radio the other day. So Victor Davis Hanson, by all accounts, is a uh, an outstanding classicist, mm -hmm. uh, someone who works in a very narrow research area, right. but he's also a political commentator on yeah. every subject under and the sun. And he's affiliated with the Hoover, Hoover Institution right. now, and he write, or used to write a lot for National Review and exactly. a, a bunch of right-wing publications. Exactly. So I see someone like him that when he when he ventures outside of his expertise, mm -hmm. uh, I mean it's no different than the commentary you get from a Michelle Malkin or one mm -hmm. of these uh, Ann Coulter or types of commentators that mm -hmm. are um, uh, basically writing red meat for the conservative base. Yeah, and uh, it, you know I think there's a danger there. Yeah, uh, it, unfortunately I think it does discredit some of uh, his uh, scholarly work mm -hmm. because it's now uh, associated with the guy that writes these bomb throwing off beds. Yeah. Um, Hans Hermann Hoppe. Yes. Is one of your, I, he's, I, I was going to say he's one of your white whales. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's certainly into whiteness. But, uh, that is certainly the case. Um, Hoppe, you know, who taught for years at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, was a protege of, or a colleague of Murray Rothbard exactly. and things like that. What's your beef with Hoppe, and um, is he somebody who needs to be critiqued more forcefully within Absolutely. the broad libertarian world? Yeah, so he is strange. So Hoppe has strangely uh, come to prominence as like this figure he's seen as the designated heir of Rothbard, mm -hmm. and as supposedly who had designated himself as the heir, heir of, of Mises, Mises right? exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you argue that they fundamentally misread Mises. That is absolutely the case. Okay, what, what's the basis of that? So the clearest is uh, the question of immigration. Mm -hmm. 
Mises is a good, solid 19th century classical liberal, especially on immigration. Mm -hmm. And he is vehement in his opposition to immigration restrictions. Mm -hmm. Does so on all the classical economic arguments. Mm -hmm. This is a theme that runs through his text from the 1910s to basically when he dies. Mm -hmm. And Hoffa has tried to invent this kind of carved out counter narrative mm -hmm. while still claiming to be a representative of Mises mm -hmm. that says we can use this propertarian concept of the nation state to exclude undesired groups, exclude mm -hmm. immigrants from crossing the borders. And it's, it's a in, complete inversion of Mises' thought, mm -hmm. and yet he's doing it under the mantle of saying, well, I'm the heir of Rothbard, who's the heir of Mises. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I argue with Hoppe and my critiques of him is he's really importing two external traditions into Austrian economics and trying to pretend or claim mm -hmm. that they are, uh, are the roots of them are there all along. What are they? So the first is his background and training. It's methodological. He is a Habermasian critical theorist, mm -hmm. but instead of Habermas is on the left, mm -hmm. he takes that and gives it a right wing spin. Mm -hmm. uh, he takes group identities and conflicts between groups as his methodological basis for mm -hmm. understanding society. And this is, uh, again, uh, Hayek, I, again, I think in the counter revolution of science, talks a lot about methodological individualism. Absolutely. That the individual is ultimately the proper unit of analysis yes, in yeah. all kind of social and cultural analysis. Yeah. Uh, but Hoppe is taking the groups, and yeah. these are they could be ethnicities, they can be mm -hmm. uh, nationalities, mm -hmm. uh, different groups of people. So it's a it's it's the same thing you see coming from the collectivist left, only he mm -hmm. takes it in a rightward direction to restrict immigration. Mm -hmm. And then the second external influence that he brings in, and you you find this in his work, uh, Democracy: The God That Failed, is his big mm -hmm. treatise. Yeah. Um, it's actually some really ugly kind of racial eugenicist style uh, thinkers, biological thinkers from uh, the mid 20th century. Uh, uh, so J. Philippe Rushton, who was this mm -hmm. uh, eugenics thinker, uh, talked about like IQ. A Canadian, being so yeah, yeah. Canadian um, uh, academic. Yeah. Yeah, there's another passage he cites um, uh, Jean Raspail, The Camp of the Saints, mm -hmm. which is this dystopian novel about. Uh, hordes of immigrants from mm -hmm. uh, the developing world invading right. Europe. And uh, he, he's importing this into, the, into his, uh, what's supposedly presented as an Austrian economics contribution. Mm -hmm. But there's a point in the book where he, he acknowledges that yes, Mises was a, a liberal on immigration, mm -hmm. but he says something to the effect of, well, this is an antiquated way of thinking that was suitable for the 19th century, but not for today. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to cite like Raspail and, and Rushton mm -hmm. and these, uh, these real cranky, uh, basically racists on the right. Mm -hmm. And more recently, He's even started to, to pull upon um, uh, Holocaust denier types. Hmm. So he published an article a few years ago where it's got a, um, a, a quotation across the top. The quotation's about uh, how history is shaped uh, by the person that's telling it. And the, uh, the author is uh, uh, David Irving, hmm. who's notorious... Uh, anti-Semitic Holocaust denier. Mm -hmm. And even though the quote itself doesn't uh, mention a name, you look up the source of the quote, it comes from a, it's a pro-Hitler biography, basically. Yeah. Um, what do you, uh, you know, what do you attribute Hoppe's, um, you know, I, I a conceivably growing um, uh, influence within yeah. certain libertarian circles. Why are libertarians gravitating towards that? Yeah. I think a couple of reasons there. One is he does offer an avenue for people that come with prior racial beliefs, uh, mm -hmm. including racist beliefs, mm -hmm. to attach themselves onto libertarianism. Uh, and these are people that have been, uh, probably with good reason, ostracized from other political camps, mm -hmm. as no one wants the racial baggage that they like, bring. Who are those people? Oh, the, the, this is where you get some of the alt-right uh, mm -hmm. types. Um, you know, uh, uh, was Richard Spencer, for example, mm -hmm. has appeared at several of Hoppe's uh, conferences mm -hmm. that he holds over. Although in Spencer now has become kind of kind like of a weird. liberal progressive <laughs> yeah. and has dating profiles where he seems to be open to uh, dating anybody you know, kind of desperately. Right. So he's right. given up the rate. I mean, I guess that filter, you know, he's, well, he needs more of an audience. Itinerant uh, pseudo-intellectuals that mm -hmm. are trying to find whoever will yeah. uh, allow them to grift off of them for a reason. Do you think with somebody like Mises, do you consider Mises a primary influence on you? I do. Yeah. Um, not not the only. I come more right. more explicitly from the public choice tradition, yeah. but I think Mises is deep in the intellectual background of that. Yeah. 
Uh, you know, he's and a, do you think? Uh, I mean, is Mises fundamentally a an individualist? Absolutely. And how yeah. do, how does that play out? Because it's you know within libertarianism, and there's this tension, and you see it definitely in Hayek, where he talks about you know okay, you need you you know there are universal human rights and and universal rationales and things like that, but then the local tradition and local knowledge and distributed knowledge yeah. and respect for the accumulated wisdom of tradition and custom is very important, even as every once in a while we need to be able, we need to be willing to burn it down because ultimately uh-huh. individuals should be free to do what they want. Um, can you talk a little bit about Mises' individualism and how that should be, you know, foregrounded in our discussion of him in contemporary yeah. moments? Well, this is the core of his economic thesis. He comes straight out of the marginal revolution, which is built around the subjective theory of value mm-hmm. and the ultimate subjective unit is the individual, right. uh, it's personal preference. Mm-hmm. And if you are constructing an e- economic approach out of that, uh, you have to reckon with the individual as, as your basic unit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this, this expands- and those, and those preferences, the subjective preferences that individuals have are fundamentally individual as opposed to group. Right. Or, I mean, or ultimately the individual takes them on and expresses them. Yeah. Even if you you know you grow up in a particular community, it might be Catholic, it might be Jewish, it might be, you know, Italian or Irish or whatever, but ultimately it's the individual make doing all the calculation. That, that is absolutely and it allows also <clears throat> for the individual to change, to evolve, mm-hmm. uh, to discover, right. discover new knowledge and uh, and take it in new directions. Mm-hmm. So there was a, uh, a, unfortunately, it's a very obscure episode, but Mises in 1926, uh, he's a German-speaking academic at the Mm -hmm. University of Vienna. Uh, He happened to be traveling through uh, Germany, and he attended a lecture by Keynes at the University of Berlin. Mm -hmm. And this lecture becomes Keynes' famous essay, The End of Mm Laissez-Faire. And Mises actually writes a German-language review of the lecture, uh, and it is damning uh, that the gist of which is... uh, First, he sees Keynes going off in a collectivist direction by Mm -hmm. talking about groups rather than the individual. And second, as Keynes is talking about groups, he starts veering, Keynes does, into eugenic theory Mm -hmm. about shaping humanity in a a scientific direction. Mm -hmm. And Mises is basically screaming at him in this essay. He says, look, you idiot, there are Nazis in the audience there that you are giving cover Mm -hmm. to, that you are, are, are fueling... Uh, their ability to do these horrendous things like restrict immigration from mm-hmm. Eastern Europe uh, or to persecute people based on their right. group membership, not their individuals. Uh, so he is railing against this. And I think that cuts to the core of how Mises sees the political world. Mm-hmm. It's when politics veers into group identity as the unit uh, mm-hmm. that decisions are made and, and the resources are allocated and then eventually persecution follows yep. against the outgroup. Uh, that's when you descend into tyranny. That's when you descend into Nazism or socialism. How? What is the role, uh, you know, for nationalism in this, uh, you know, world? Because and and yeah. Mises obviously is somebody, and uh, Joseph Schumpeter is similar, where mm-hmm. they are kind of chased out of every polity or every jurisdiction that they exactly. lived in, and half the time those places are collapsing or dis- literally and figuratively disappearing as they're moving out of it or being forced out. Um, but in an American context, you know, how, you know, there is a nation state and there is an American identity. And sometimes we like to think that it's the universal identity. Um, but, you know, how does Mises or how do you use Mises to kind of square, you know, like national identity and or, or group identities that are freely chosen and individual identity? Yeah, yeah. Well, there is a, a liberal internationalism that's fundamental to Mises, mm-hmm. and you see this. And he does; he gets chased out of Austria mm-hmm. by the Nazis. Yeah, uh, he lands in Switzerland, which is thankfully kind of like a lifeboat for the German-speaking world, and he makes his way to the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, but where he's where the nation state, I think, comes into that is, I mean, the nation state is an institutional curator of norms mm-hmm. of systems of law and legal traditions. Mm -hmm. And you can go in a a bit of a Hayekian tradition here. Uh, Hayek's point is not that the British Empire is the greatest thing ever. Mm -hmm. Hayek's point is that the British common law system has allowed enough slack to Mm -hmm. encounter the problem of information and knowledge, Mm -hmm. but also enough stability that you can start seeing and discerning patterns of norms. And the point is not to say, hey, we're rah-rah United States or rah-rah Canada or whatever country you happen to be in. It's that those 
countries have um, institutional systems of government that seem to be at least uh, upholding and protecting the stability of those um, uh, notions of property right. rights and fair adjudication before the courts. Mm -hmm. Even when they fail, uh, there at least is an ideal that yeah. we go back and point to and aspire to. And this is all very anti-utopian, ultimately, Absolutely. right? It's like it, it's meeting a bare minimum of like letting the discovery process and, and kind of self-actualization develop. Yeah. yeah. It, it, there's a, there's a, a Humean in the David Hume sense mm -hmm. strain of let's compare stable rule of law, uh, organically developed mm -hmm. norms to uh, people that come in and try to impose a utopian. Who's Hume's uh, great villain in his history? It's Oliver Cromwell mm. uh, that's stepping in with this like quasi-religious mm -hmm. uh, top-down state. And what happens? Hundreds of thousands of people are slaughtered. It's the, the well, now we are on the opposite sides of the barricade because I, I but Cromwell also ended a system. He does. That was <laughs> right. as I mean, the tragedy is he became as abusive as the exactly. system that he replaced. Exactly. Unfortunately, uh, and there's a there's a very libertarian story to be told about right. that. Right. We get uh, freeborn John Lilburn yeah, is absolutely is, uh, yeah. Now it, he's the hero of, of exactly. all these stories. But, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a point where in the in the 1650s he's <clears> in exile in a castle and. Like, Jersey or something, and he writes a letter, and he's looking out and seeing what Cromwell has become. He says, yep. "Had I known this, I would take King Charles a thousand times over." Right, right, which is a damning commentary it is. on Cromwell. <laughs> yeah. um, so, speaking of Hayek and Mises, there was there was a moment towards the end of the twentieth century uh, when um, I guess in the, in the New Yorker, Robert Heilbronner, the mm -hmm. you know a popular economist who wrote uh, what was it, the Worldly Philosophers, which it. was like yeah. this. Fantastic best-selling book that was an introduction to economics. Heilbronner was, uh, you know, a kind of left of center, you know, central planning is going to be good type of economist. At the end of the 20th century, he said, you know, uh, uh, Hayek, uh, you know, Keynes was wrong and Hayek and Mises were right. Yeah. Um, and it was this moment where Hayek and Mises, who had always been kind of on the edges of, you know, certainly academic life, but also intellectual life, they, their legacy was rediscovered, and you know, and now we're within the libertarian moment we, uh, movement. We contest it, but you know, they're broadly influential. You are doing an interesting project about how Karl Marx went from kind of being nobody to becoming, you know, the motive force in like much of the 20th century. I mean, it was you know, in a lot of ways, you know, the the ascendance of Hayek and Mises towards, or you know, an embrace of their intellectual lineage. You know, countermanded Marx's uh, reputation. Talk about what you're doing yeah. with Marx, and you know, what can we learn from what you're doing about how uh, you know the past is not a stable entity. It's something that we're recreating in the current moment to affect the present as well as the future. Yeah. So the state of Marx right now, uh, he's very much ascendant in intellectual life. Mm -hmm. And there have been multiple metrics. He, he uh, is consistently one of the top two or three most assigned authors in mm -hmm. college courses. Uh, Nature Magazine did a, an empirical study of Google citation counts, and he comes up at the very top of the list of the most influential scholars. There's philosophers who have declared him the single most significant social scientist of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, he is ubiquitous across the humanities and social sciences mm -hmm. as a presence, with the exception of economics, right. where he's seen as kind of this antiquated, uh, yeah. debunked. Uh, but, but we go back to Marx's life, he is fundamentally writing as an economist. Mm -hmm. Das Kapital is a critique of political economy. Mm -hmm. uh, he presents himself as making his major contribution there. So the discipline that he set out to influence rejected him very mm -hmm. early on. Yeah. Part of it is he just happens to be at a moment in time when the labor theory of value is being displaced by mm -hmm. uh, subjective or marginal value. Mm -hmm. And as a result, he falls into obscurity that by the turn of the 20th century, the Economic Journal runs a, uh, a book review of a new ed edition of Das Kapital, and the author of it says, who should tilt at such a windmill? Mm. Saying Marx is Don Quixote. Yeah. Uh, he's a nobody in our discipline. So I asked the question, how does Marx get from that in, say, circa 1900, uh, a peripheral, obsolete mm -hmm. footnote in the history of economic thought, to a little over 100 years later, uh, this, this giant across multiple right. disciplines? And I did some investigation looking at Marx's citation counts in academic journals and books, and you find they just kind of piddle along from his death 
uh, till a very specific event, 1917, and they triple overnight. Mm -hmm. And then it's just off to the races since there. So what happened in 1917 is the Bolshevik Revolution mm -hmm. that proclaims a state built on Marxist principles after mm -hmm. Lenin seizes control of a major world power. Yeah. So the empirical study that I'm doing here is asking the counterfactual. It's myself and Michael McCovey is my co-author. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is we've collected over 200 uh, authors from the 19th century that were contemporaries of Marx. And you can see where their citation counts matched Marx prior mm -hmm. to 1917. And you find that he is not a top tier thinker. He's not up there with Adam Smith or John mm -hmm. Locke or John Stuart Mill right. or even someone like Herbert Spencer is, mm -hmm. is a giant of that right. era. Yeah. Uh, now kind of obscure. Uh, Marx comes in roughly at the level of Johannes Karl Rodbertus mm. and Ferdinand LaSalle mm -hmm. and some of these uh, fairly obscure socialist thinkers right. by, by our own time that, that were his contemporaries. So, I, I mean, it kind of makes sense if Lenin, you know, Lenin is the hype man for Marx. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a successful revolution in that, the you know, the Soviets take over and, you know, and then they have a pretty good run. Why does the end of the Soviet Union not discredit Marx? Right. If anything, and it, you know, there was a moment actually, I think, yeah. in the 90s where I can remember again, I was in grad school in literary and cultural studies, and people were like, okay, you know, we got to stop emphasizing Marx. And there was, there was a boomlet in Hayek among left wingers. They were like, oh, you know, we can learn a lot from mm -hmm. Hayek in particular. Um, but you know, Marx is back, baby. You know, he's like top gun, right? That's exactly. You, you, so yeah, what well, what's so, going on? Soviet with that? Union falls apart, and they find out that all the supposed economic prowess, the stuff that Paul mm -hmm. Samuelson had been projecting, right, Soviets right, yeah, would overtake yeah. America. Yeah, it's it's like painted over rust on old machinery. Yeah, and I think the fall of the Soviet Union reveals that, along right. with the atrocities that yeah, you start yeah, of seeing. Uh, but there was a weird moment, and I think it happened between the the, the mid nineteen nineties, early two thousands where people that were of the left, that were ideologically or philosophically inclined to Marxism, dissociated Marx from the Soviet experiment. Mm -hmm. Even though the Soviet experiment had been the thing that elevated him, right. they said, oh, well. He's in all yeah. the paintings. He's exactly. in all the, you know, it's never, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And it's like this, this open question. They said, well, well yeah. the Soviet Union is not true socialism. They right. deviated from Marx, here's yeah, the other yeah. way. And I'm sitting here saying, wait a minute, you owe the fact that this guy is even on the intellectual map to the events of 1917 and the Soviet state dumping millions upon millions yeah. of dollars worth of resources into promoting him and uh, yeah. his intellectual work. Do you feel like and now you know that's let you know we're we're 20 years on from you know into the new century and everything like that? People talk about a crisis in global capitalism, yeah. uh, you know, and clearly in the West and OECD countries, uh, yeah. you know, there are, you know, a lot of people believe that the economy is not working, that a neoliberal or a liberal right. economy, et cetera, is not working. Do you agree with that critique? Um, and if so, what are the ways to kind of engage that and either dismiss it or yeah. to actually engage it and come up with a new formulation of how something approaching liberal individualism and market capitalism can yeah. be reinvigorated? Yeah. Well, I think the, the, it goes down to the problem with the term neoliberal. Okay. What is a neoliberal? Uh, and we find out, we look into the history of it, uh, it it's kind of a pejorative term sure. that emerges for anything and everything mm -hmm. that's slightly free market that I don't like right. uh, by the people that use it. Uh, and it's, it's a relatively recent ascendance, that the, mm -hmm. this notion of a neoliberal international mm -hmm. order. Uh, you cannot find citations to this term prior to about 1990 in any significant right. way. But I mean, are we, you know, th there's no question that the, uh, you know, uh, we live in a much more globalized world. Yeah. Trade, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, with minor exceptions and especially over the past couple of years, but trade became much easier. Uh, tariffs fell. Uh, mobility became increased. I mean, it seems like capitalism on a broad sense point, even, even China Absolutely. is doing capitalism. And now are we, are we, you know, running into a problem with that because everybody in the United States, whether they're, you know, Trump or Joe Biden are complaining about capitalism. That's, yeah. Um, well, it's like capitalism itself has always been the concept that gets none of the credit for the things that right. uh, it achieves and all of the blame mm -hmm. for things that uh, are often actually impositions on a laissez-faire or more free yeah. market order. Um, and so you, you see someone like Trump coming at it from the right or Bernie Sanders coming at it yeah. from the left. They're both trade protectionists. Mm -hmm. 
and they're saying trade has taken the jobs of the American yeah. factories and moved it abroad. And you, you find that critique is fundamentally wrong. Well, I think it's yeah. empirically wrong. They are not understanding uh, uh, the gains from trade mm -hmm. that occur to an economy. It's, it's the classic Bastiat seen versus right. unseen. And we see this as a recurring pattern in history. In the 19th century, after Richard Cobden and John Bright uh, successfully overturned the Corn Laws, mm -hmm. they initiate a period of radical liberalization of the international mm -hmm. economy, unprecedented to that point in world history. And uh, it has significant economic effects that are beneficial, I think, to yeah. humanity as a whole, but they also get blamed for uh, recessionary events that occur in the late yeah. 19th century. They get blamed for rising inequality, uh, for disrupting the old order. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's often unfairly blamed yeah. uh, because there's other so things. Do you so, say, I mean, is, is the, are the main problems with America now, it's that we need to educate people that things are not as bad as they think or they're being told yeah. or are things getting bad and we need to well, address that? I mean, it's a rhetorical strategy, but I think coming at it from a libertarian free market mm -hmm. perspective, we're at a disadvantage. The other side is promising ponies and unicorns mm -hmm. and uh, wonderful things paid for by the state. Uh, they, they don't really execute on them uh, very well, right. uh, and often it goes quite the other direction, but uh, they come back with more and more promises. Mm -hmm. It's the action biases. I will solve your problems if yeah. you elect me. And we're saying, no, just leave us alone. Don't do yeah. anything. Do you, well, do you think, I mean, do you think, and this may be an absurd question, but do you think the average American or the typical, typical American is materially worse off now than they were 20 years ago or 40 years ago? I, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. I think the, uh, uh, I mean, I've studied inequality yeah. statistics. Uh, what I'll say on Piketty and Sayers right. and these economists that work on it, they exaggerate their numbers. Right. Uh, some of it is probably intentional. I think mm -hmm. the worst instances of it where they show these these curves of inequality going yeah. up like that. Yeah, the Gatsby curve. Exactly, kind of yeah. exactly. But then, you know, when younger people, and, you know, this is something that's very much of, uh, you know, a millennial, part of millennial discourse and Gen Z discourse is that, yeah, they really are going to be the first generation to have a lower standard of living than their parents. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a late boomer. I was born in 63. I heard that all my life. It turned out to be radically false. Yeah. You know, um, but, you know, these guys, they really mean it. Is that is that just they're, you know, they're wrong and they're being sold a false narrative or is there something to that? Yeah. So the one area where I think there is something to that, housing policy. Mm -hmm. Clear as day that the restriction of the housing supply uh, through nimbyism, mm -hmm. uh, through uh, basically what you see in San Francisco where yeah. you cannot build uh, anything anywhere, right. which is coming from a political preference of the boomer generation. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that already have the houses and they don't want yeah. their view obstructed. Yeah. Uh, that has thrown the housing market into shambles, uh, but it's a misdiagnosis mm -hmm. of what's going on here. This is a, a clear case of where government intervention into the free market has mm -hmm. made things worse off yeah. and has prevented uh, the route to home ownership, the route mm -hmm. to uh, greater economic stability mm -hmm. uh, from being access to a large swaths of the population because yeah. they're driven out of the market by restriction. Um, switch gears for a final uh, kind of topic. You are, um, you've, you are putting together a book about COVID. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, you know, our COVID policy responses, what, what is the book about and, um, you know, how should we be thinking about COVID? I don't know. I was going to say now that it's in the rear view mirror, yeah. I don't know that that's Fingers true. Crossed, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's like, it's kind of both, uh, you know, on the horizon always and in the rear view mirror, but what's yeah. going on with COVID policy? Yeah. So, uh, this was intended when we put it together is through AIER mm -hmm. as, a, an academic symposium of analyzing what just happened right. and comparing it to past instances, uh, kind of a post-mortem of mm -hmm. the past two years. And why did we uh, basically fail at bringing this disease under control after two weeks to flatten the curve between mm -hmm. two months became two years? Right. Uh, so the question I ask in my chapter, and there's about a dozen different academics that take different mm -hmm. angles of it, but the question I ask in my chapter is about uh, taking on the COVID response strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, as a, a classic example of a failed attempt at central planning. Mm -hmm. uh, the notion was that we had Fauci came out here with all these uh, epidemiology models. They told us exactly what to do, what levers to pull. Mm -hmm. You lock down when case numbers hit this. You put a mask mandate when case numbers mm -hmm. hit this. 
and none of it worked. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's assessing that question of what went wrong and what it comes down to, I think, is a fundamentally Hayekian uh, observation. There was a pretense of knowledge that the models had it right. Mm -hmm. There's a pretense of knowledge that the medicine uh, behind this particular disease was well understood and all we had to do was execute on the plan. Mm -hmm. And at every stage, they fail to account for something else. Or it turns out that the, uh, uh, the science was not as settled as it actually was. Right. Uh, and then you start getting institutional factors. Uh, you get bureaucrats involved that are interested in boosting their own budget right. and their own power. So this, I mean, the public choice analysis exactly. is strong. Exactly. But then, you know, in the United States, we had a pretty decentralized, or, or, yeah. I mean, on some levels, it was super centralized. The FDA and exactly. the CDC asserted monopoly control over certain kinds of testing and, uh, you know, vaccine rollout and all of that kind of stuff. But on another level, you know, and this was partly, you know, it's unclear if it was a strategy by Trump or, you know, just kind of a fuck up. But like, <laughs> right. we had, you know, a pretty dispersed response. Different cities and different states did different things. That was not a good thing or or it was, you know. It's a, a double-edged sword again. Yeah. I mean, you look at someone like Bill de Blasio in New York City, mm -hmm. um, has stricter restrictions than anywhere in the area around him. Right. Uh, so he is like, executing a central plan of his yeah. own, only it's on a, a micro level. Right. And there are certain state governors uh, early in the pandemic. The one moment that uh, sticks out to me is where I see this is really kind of going off the rails is the governor of Rhode Island set up police checkpoints on Interstate 95, mm -hmm. and they were pulling and diverting people with the non-Rhode Island license right. plates. And it lasted about a day. Yeah. Uh, but I see this, this is like a petty tyranny. First off, it's unconstitutional, yeah. right, right. all sorts of problems with it. Uh, so yeah, you, you, in a decentralized federalist system, mm -hmm. you have the good cases of people that either corrected course or never mm -hmm. uh, were inclined to a centrally planned route. But you also have the bad cases of people that persisted in mm -hmm. uh, maintaining regulations well beyond their known efficacy or mm -hmm. well beyond their own failure. Uh, so it, it really does become a mixed bag. You see this in other countries. Yeah. So Australia is notorious for certain uh, uh, states in Australia had draconian lockdowns that right. went on for months and months and months. Others are relatively open. Yeah. Uh, but And was it that there was no, like, it didn't matter like, because pretty much the disease was going to be the disease regardless yeah. of the policy response or was it that certain policies were much worse than others? Uh, so I, I definitely think it's, uh, certain policies were much worse than others, but they were put forth with a pretense of certainty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lockdowns are the classic example and some of the best empirical work that's coming out, they show there's yeah. basically no difference uh, in how the disease played out, whether you were heavily locked down or not locked right. down at all. Yeah. Um, we also know that before the pandemic, if you go read the, the WHO reports from right. 2019, they say, don't do lockdowns. Yeah. And they're basing that off of the Spanish flu outbreak right. when they couldn't even keep this off of military bases mm -hmm. uh, that went into complete lockdown in 1918. Yeah. What, uh, what spurred the, you know, the actual move to a lockdown? Because it's really yeah. unprecedented and it's, you know, that, yeah. it, it, that has kind of receded, that question. But yeah, what, why yeah. did we lock down? March 16th, 2020. And that's the date that the Imperial College Neil Ferguson mm -hmm. model was published. And we're starting to see some of the evidence of this. It turns out it's Fauci and Deborah Burks mm -hmm. brought it to the forefront of the U.S. COVID task yeah. force. And they got all of the public health authorities, although Trump couldn't impose it himself, he right. could endorse it. And it was like he gave a letter to 50 governors saying, uh, run free with this. And of yeah. those 50, like 42 of them take the, the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, this, it happened simultaneously in the UK because mm -hmm. uh, that's when the model was projected. Right. And uh, for various reasons, the media hype that was around it, they elevated Ferguson's model above all others. And it turns out two years later, it was the worst performing of any of the models. Right. Wow. Um, what is the lesson going forward uh, for this? Because, you know, COVID is, you know, is kind of over, but, yeah. you know, we're, we're going to be dealing with it in various, you know, permutations for a long time. But the policy framework yeah. that gets in place, has this discredited that kind of like lockdown mentality or top down stuff? Or has it, you know, or is this the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, is this the use case of that? Like, is this, you know, are we, are we going to be seeing this more often or not? Yeah. I hope that it has fostered enough of a skepticism that the, uh, the public response, if they try to lock down again, yeah. will say, no way. 
Uh, and I think we've seen enough of the protests and resistance that's come against that. Uh, the public health authorities, on the other hand, now they have a vested interest because they see, they discover how far they could get with this. Yeah. There was an interview Ferguson from Imperial College did uh, about a year into the pandemic, and he's recounting his own thinking. He says, well, we saw China lock down, but we thought, uh, we, we couldn't pull this off in a Western democracy. Right. But then they start seeing signs that Italy was doing it, and he was like, aha, there's our opening. Mm -hmm. And he basically admits that that's what he seized upon. Yeah. Uh, one thing I think on the policy uh, level that we can actually pay attention to is a lot of the powers that uh, were used to enact these were emergency measures that came in the wake of 9-11 mm -hmm. when everyone thought there was going to be a bioterrorism pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the Bush administration was, was really horrible yeah. about this. Yeah, yeah. They said, uh, let's pass all these laws that give governors or mayors mm -hmm. or uh, town councils the authority to supersede normal rule of law with a public right. health board. Uh, and I think it's time that we start thinking about scaling back those measures because mm -hmm. it, it what turned out uh, started as bioterrorism was the perfect excuse yeah. for a, a different type of medical emergency. All right, we're going to leave it there. Phil Magnus, thanks for talking to Reason. Absolutely, thanks for having me.